believe we have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination except we have been called by his name. I'm your host, H.C. Felder, and today the topic is Evidence of Noah's Flood. And I have with me a special guest. My special guest is Ted Wright. Let me tell you about Ted. Ted has a bachelor's in archaeology. He has a master's in apologetics from Southern Evangelical Seminary. We went to seminary together. He uh, is an instructor at Southern Evangelical Bible College. And he's also a professor at New Life Theological Seminary here in Charlotte. Welcome to the show, Ted. Thanks, Harold. Appreciate it. What did I leave out? Uh, my wife and kid. All right, there you go. Yes. There you go. Married, got one, one little boy, eight years old. Good. So tell me, how did you get interested in this topic? Well, um, you know, I teach Old Testament, and uh, it's, it's a subject that I'm naturally interested in. But, um, but also, uh, it's, it's, it's something you have to deal with uh, if you're a Christian and you believe the Bible. Uh, you ha you want to try to find out uh, if some of these stories that you learned as a child are they you know did they really happen, and uh, is there any evidence that they happened uh, besides just being in the Bible? As it turns out, there's actually a lot of evidence that the flood actually happened on the earth, and it's a very controversial subject I know, but um, the Bible is very clear about there you know there's a lot of, there's some Bible verses that are kind of unclear about certain things, but so what is the Bible's version of the flood. Tell us what is Noah's flood. Okay, in Genesis, Genesis 6 through 8 describes an event in earth's history that basically destroyed the entire surface of the earth uh, in a catastrophic extinction event that's un been unparalleled in all of earth's history. Um, this, this event we call uh, the biblical flood or the Genesis flood. Um, in recent times, uh, many evangelicals uh, and, and of course a lot of people in the world uh, question the historicity of the flood uh, and say that it didn't happen. It was just maybe maybe there was a local flood or something like that uh, and maybe in Mesopotamia. But uh, as, a, as a believer in, in the Bible, as a believer in inerrancy, the Bible contains the Word of God or the Bible is the Word of God and that the Bible cannot make mistakes, then uh, we can't compromise on the flood that there has to be evidence for the flood, uh, and there is. In fact, in the New Testament, uh, Peter wrote this in 2 Peter chapter 3. He said, um, and he's talking, about the, uh, he's talking about God's future judgment of the world, and then he connects that with the, the past judgment of the flood. He says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will scum, come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. He says, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, the world also at that time was deluged or flooded and destroyed. He says, but the same word, uh, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. So here, Peter says that people will deliberately forget that God sent a flood many, many years ago to destroy everybody and everything on the face of the earth, of course, except uh, Noah. And of course, Jesus affirmed the flood when in Matthew chapter 24, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Again, connecting Jesus' coming, his second coming, with the uh, judgment at the flood. So, so we've got New Test really good New Testament evidence, uh, at least affirming the historicity of the flood. And uh, I recently got to do something uh, last year uh, that uh, just was pretty amazing. And I know you were, you were going to um, ask me about that, um, about the uh, Grand Canyon trip. Right. Um, last year, um, la last summer actually, I got to go to the Grand Canyon and study the, uh, the actual geology of the Grand Canyon. And uh, part of the reason why we went, it was actually 26 other scholars. And uh, we went with a geologist, with an astronomer, with a, uh, a philosopher and with a theologian, a biblical scholar, and we looked at the evidence of the, uh, of the canyon, how the canyon was formed. Um, now, obviously, the claim that we're making, Christians are claiming, and the people who believe in the Bible, is a pretty big claim that, that God destroyed the entire world with water. I mean, that's a pretty big claim. So if it's a pretty big claim, that requires pretty big evidence. I mean, I think right. you would agree with that. Right. Uh, as it turns out, there is enormous amount of evidence 
for the flood, and the Grand Canyon is one of those evidences. In fact, it is, uh, I like to call it Exhibit A in the evidence for the flood, and I'm going to come to that in a second. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the gentlemen that was with us, the scholars, on this, on this trip to the Grand Canyon was uh, an Australian geologist by the name of Dr. Andrew Snelling. And uh, Dr. Snelling basically lists uh, six geological evidences. We've got the New Testament evidence, we've got the biblical evidence, but what about the physical evidence? Right. Well, Dr. Snelling lists six evidences geologically. Uh, if there is a flood, okay, if, if, if we're going to assume, or maybe just for the sake of argument, maybe there was a flood, what would you expect to find? And this is what he lists. He, number one, you would find fossilized sea creatures high above sea level. And that's exactly what you find literally around the world. Uh, many people may not know this, but on the tops of uh, the Himalayan mountains, which is the tallest mountain range in the world, we find marine fossils on the top of, uh, near the top of Mount Everest, which of course, wow. you know, it's been growing for, for thousands of years and, and it, because of the uh, plate tectonics there, the Himalayan mountains are being pushed up. But the point is that even with them being mountains, there was fossilized sea creatures, and not, so, not just there, but everywhere. So is the, is the theory then that because the whole Earth was submerged in water, that when the Earth started to subside, or when the water started to subside, then the sea creatures died on the top of the mountains? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's part of the thing. And then, uh, and then secondly, uh, rapid burial of plants and animals. Rapid, in other words, rapid fossilization. That's what you find literally around the world. Um, you know, there's some controversy and some, some scholarly debate as to actually how fossils are formed. Um, some fossils form, you know, where the animal will die and they'll maybe fall into a lake bed or something like that and over a slow period of time, the bones will be covered up by sediment and, and silt and things like that. But what you find is, um, typically when you find really, really big uh, assemblages of fossils, uh, whether they be dinosaurs or plants, you find them rapidly buried. In other words, instantaneously buried. In other words, when they were alive, presumably. And uh, in, in, in the southern part of Utah, there's a place called Dinosaur National Monument. And uh, you've got literally thousands of dinosaur fossils uh, in one place, all jumbled up together, which indicate uh, sedimentation or flood and rapid burial. And then uh, in, in the Gobi Desert in China, you find uh, thousands of dinosaur fossils as well. But again, rapidly buried. And that's another evidence of a flood. Uh, now, how is that evidence of a flood? Because they're rapidly buried? Mm -hmm. Because what happens is, is that when water, when, whenever you, let's just, let's just reverse the clock back for a second and talk about like a local flood. Let's say if you have a local flood, what floods do, you, you have a massive amount of moving water. Right. And when water, water is very, as you can see in a, in a hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, you know, did massive amounts of damage in New Orleans. Well, when, if you've got, you, if you, you know, make that go a lot, lot bigger, then you've got a lot of sediment, a lot of dirt and silt and sand that gets carried and transported and whatever animals that are in the way or it, whatever's in the way will be buried with, by that sediment. So oh, rapid okay. sedimentation. Um, so that's, that's an evidence of that. Uh, and then also the third thing he lists is rapidly deposited sediment layers that spread across vast areas. Um, you, a lot of people might not know this, but the very top layers of all the rocks in the world are sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks only form underwater or by water or by some type of water, like um, you've got sandstone, limestone, uh, shale. Uh, these are all sedimentary types of rocks, and uh, you find these uh, sediment layers spread across vast areas. And then you find sediment transported long distances, uh, these, the sediments will be carried over long distances, another evidence that you find around the world. Then uh, number five, uh, rapid or no erosion between strata. So uh, now, of course, the typical geologist will tell you today that uh, in the different rock layers that they call strata, there, this happened over millions and millions of years of time. And uh, so what we see, now what, they, what they say we see is we see millions of years of time sequentially layered in the, uh, in the fossil record. But what you see is rapid, in other words, very, very fast, or no erosion between strata, which meant that uh, there was no time for them to erode. Now, over, you know, you know if, it's, uh, if it's millions, if the Earth is millions of years old, mm -hmm. then you would expect to find in that strata that's laid down, you'd expect to find some erosion or some type of weathering. You don't find that 
that, which means that the sediment was laid as soon as one sediment was laid, then another sediment was laid on top of okay, it. Okay, I got you. So that means that indicates something that happened rapidly instead right. of slowly over right. a long period of time. For you know, when you uh, you have uh, uh, what we call uh, weathering uh, like oh. types of things, and then. Um, the sixth thing he gives uh, Dr. Snelling is many strata are laid down in rapid succession. And um, all of these things, as I uh, mentioned, are all actually found in the Grand Canyon. Uh, when we were in the canyon, and I like to talk about the canyon yes, if I could. Sure. Um, the Grand Canyon, of course, um, many people have probably been to the Grand Canyon, maybe seen pictures of it. Uh, it's in the northwestern corner of Arizona. It's basically an, an enormous geological uh, laboratory, and it's a picture of Earth's entire geological history. Because what you find is uh, it's, a, it's a classic example of erosion, uh, unparalleled anywhere on the Earth. Uh, so when you start out in the canyon, in the very, very uh, uh, upper edges of the canyon, uh, called Marble Canyon, uh, you're, you're basically uh, up in, in our time zone, in other words, in the, in the modern time zone. Mm -hmm. But as you get on the river, on the Colorado River, and you float down in the canyon, you literally are going deeper and deeper down into Earth's history. And so as you travel along the river, you're literally going back in time geologically. So you can see the, the Earth's layers getting deeper. Well, the whole top layer of the Grand Canyon, all the sediments, there were horizontal sediments that had to be laid down first. Right. The canyon is just that negative taking away of all that you know, it carved out the erosion. Right, right, I guess uh, so. But you have to explain the horizontal layers before you explain the actual canyon itself. Right. So those layers have to be accounted for. And how do they get there? And where do they come from? And uh, what do they all mean? Well, those horizontal layers are all sedimentary, which meant that they were laid down by water. And uh, these are all in the Grand Canyon. Um, the, uh, the canyon is carved through uh, sedimentary layers of limestone, sandstone, and shale. Uh, but it also reaches down, and you go all the way back under that into the very bedrock of the North American continent in, into what's called metamorphic rock, which is, which is a very, very hard rock, which only uh, we find in the deepest layers of the earth. Uh, this layer serves basically as the, uh, as, again, as the foundation of North American continent. So when you go in the top layers of the Grand Canyon, you're in sedimentary rock, and you go to the bottom layers of the canyon, and you're in metamorphic rock. So, which, so basically, you have a snapshot of all of the actual layers. Now, they have different names around the world, but they're basically sedimentary layers around the world. They may, they may name them different things. Um, but uh, there are ba about, um, about eight evidences uh, from the canyon supporting uh, a flood, which we believe is the flood of Noah. And, um, uh, well, the, for the first thing is basically the formation of the Grand Canyon. The typical example that you'd get is uh, how the Grand Canyon was formed is that it was, uh, it, you know, the Colorado River over millions of years carved through the canyon. Um, well, again, there are certain uh, geological formations that basically mitigate against that theory. In fact, there's a new uh, coming, up and coming theory, even among uh, secular geologists, where they don't, they, they're, they're, they're backtracking on the idea of the Grand Canyon being carved by the Colorado River. They're saying that it actually happened very, very rapidly, but they're calling it a breach, the breach dam theory. They believe that there was a glacial dam uh, right near uh, Utah, and that uh, at, this is during the Ice Age. And dur during the Ice Age, when this dam burst, then the water that was in that dam rushed through the Colorado Plateau and carved out the canyon. So again, they're saying that it happened rapidly, but it was just a, uh, a local, localized event. Uh, so that's one. The formation of the canyon was rapid. It wasn't gradual. Right. So that's an evidence for a massive amount of water. Number two, um, and one of the layers of the, uh, in, I believe it's in the Red Raw Limestone, you find this uh, formation called the nautiloid formation, or the nautiloid fossils. And these nautiloids are these, basically, they're like a squid. Uh, if you know what a squid looks like? Yes. You know, imagine a squid with a shell on the very tail end of it. And, and what you have in these in this fossils are actually the shells that have been fossilized, where they're, they cover about 1,500 square miles. This, in, there are literally probably have been estimated over a billion of these nautiloid fossils. So the question mm -hmm. is, where do these nautiloids come from? You know, and why in the middle of North America, in the desert, 
do you find nautiloid fossils right. in the Grand Canyon? Right. Again, an evidence that this world or a large part of the, this uh, continent was covered by water, and not just any kind of water, but salt water, like a uh, you know like a sea. Um, and then you've got um, another uh, very very problematic area for. Uh, people who say that the uh, Earth is, you know, or that the geological layers are millions of years old, there's a layer. Uh, there's a layer in the Grand Canyon called the Great Unconformity, and this is a technical name for basically. Uh, now, modern geologists they have in these different two different layers. They have like one layer will be dated to a certain millions of years ago, and this other layer is a millions of years ago. Now, in between those layers. There's supposed to be a million to two million years of time of other layers of rocks. Right. They're not there. So where do they go? They call it, geologists have a name for it, they call it the Great Unconformity because there's like a, over either a million or a billion years of time missing, depending on who you ask. But uh, it's a problem. Uh, the, the, the easiest solution is that they never were there to begin with. Right. I mean, that's the right. simplest solution. I know if it's not there, then you can't invent it. You can't invent evidence that's not there. Right. Um, and then you've got folding in the canyon. You've got these uh, these rocks that are literally bent and, and, and twisted. And, and rocks don't bend and twist unless they are moist. So that meant what, that when these rocks were laid down, they had to have been moist to, to bend and fold like this. And, uh, and then you've got uh, cross bedding, which again indicates uh, cross bedding is like a sand dune that's been cut over by other sand. So again, uh, there are lots of these geological evidences, and, and sometimes it can get kind of technical, but uh, there is geological evidence of the flood, and uh, of course, and the fossils also bear this out as well. Now, that is the evidence that you found in the Grand Canyon. In the Grand Canyon, yes. And that's just in our country. That's just in our country. And uh, there are actually, it's interesting, there are other sim very similar formations, not as big as the canyon, but there are similar canyons literally around the world. Um, uh, different types of canyons. It's interesting. I was doing some research and I actually discovered, and uh, and actually, it's, I have a, I have a photographic picture book of. Um, I'm kind of interested in geology and deserts, and I just have a big picture book on uh, on the uh, Sahara Desert, North Africa. It turns out in Tunisia, in North Africa, they actually have found a lower jawbone of a human being in fossilized in rock, and it's very interesting. It's actually it's mm. it's it's actually found in a location very very near. Where dinosaur fossils are found as well. Now, that, that's not not to say that they're connected, but I find it very interesting that you find a fossilized human lower jaw in rock in North Africa in a very uh, very close area uh, proximity to dinosaur fossils as well, and uh, it's actually on the UNESCO, the United Nations World Heritage Site. Uh, this this uh, f uh, fossilized human jawbone. Could it be a descendant of the flood or somebody who was killed during the flood? I don't know, but uh, the geologists say that it's a very, very, probably one of the oldest humans uh, that's ever been found. It's still in the rock today uh, in, the, this, this in North Africa. Now, I also uh, heard that we have fossils in the deserts here of animals that only lived in Africa. And that's further evidence that these animals were taken along, their bones were taken along with the flood. Is yeah, well, uh, the, the thing about it is that, of course, the, the biblical account tell, says that Moses, of course, uh, or not Moses, Noah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would have been funny, wouldn't it? Uh, Noah actually built an ark. And um, let me say something qu quick about the ark while mm -hmm. I'm thinking about it. Um, there was some, actually some tests done on the ark. Uh, they built a scale model. Let's see, scientists built a scale model of the ark. And uh, what's very interesting is that they put it in a tank where they test uh, super ocean liners. And what they discovered was that the, the, that the structure that God told Noah to build could actually withstand a 100 to 200 foot tidal wave. Wow. And, and, and not capsize. So, what, so, you know, people who say, well, you know, God maybe sent a local flood. Well, then if God sent a local flood, why would he tell Noah to build a, a craft? That could withstand an enormous tidal wave if it was only a local flood. Um, uh, this this craft that he told him to build had to withstand these things. But but the animals that were in there, of course, um, were two of every kind. And uh, again, that's a, that's kind of a quote. We don't know exactly know what the biblical concept of a kind is, but certainly d different types of animals are there. And uh, what we find in the flood is that, and uh, basically. Uh, 95 to 98 percent of all life was wiped out, except for just a little, you know, two to three percent on the ark. 
So if it didn't make it on the ark, it didn't get on the earth right. uh, after the flood, the post-flood earth. So probably the fossils that we find, uh, in, at least in the fossil la layers, and some of the layers in, in, in North America, are probably pre-flood. Uh, but, but again, after the flood, uh, there was actually a great cooling of the earth, and uh, we call it the ice age. And um, uh, a lot of a lot of Christian scholars, uh, scientists believe that the ice age was actually caused or was brought on by the flood, because after the flood, the earth got drastically cooler, and uh, so that brought on the ice age. And so the animals that survived the flood would have adapted to the cold climate. That's why you have woolly mammoths. That's why you have woolly rhinoceroses in North America, and uh, saber-toothed tigers and things like that. It was because their, their bodies were adapting to the cold climate of, the, er, of North America and literally around the world. There was, there was ice sheets everywhere, which is how, the, uh, uh, it's, which is how actually the uh, Native Americans got to, um, uh, got to North America from Asia. They crossed the Bering, uh, Bering Strait there uh, across Alaska from Asia, and they followed probably were, probably were following migrating herds of, uh, of, of animals uh, down through North America. Yeah, that's that's very fascinating. I, I have I have uh, some uh, a couple of objections that people mention, and I just wanted to throw them. Sure. At you. Actually, this is just one I just thought of, and that was uh, the fact that, well, you know, the flood story is a myth, and all cultures have this same myth, and because like the Babylonians had this, sure. myth, and because all these cultures have this myth, then clearly it's a myth. Sure. Well, uh, again, it, de it depends on how you define myth. You know, C.S. Lewis and, and J.R. Tolkien, two great Christian apologists, you know, said that myth it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not true. You know, we have this kind of a modern bias against myth, uh, but just because something is an old story doesn't make it not true. There are a lot of things that turn out to be true that we don't know. But uh, the interesting thing I think about that is that uh, you do find er in every culture around the world, you find a flood story. In fact, the oldest stories in the world we find in the Enuma Elish and also in Mesopotamia, you find flood stories that are almost identical to the flood story in the book of Genesis. So um, I would say, uh, you know, I would say it actually argues for the other, th it argues for the authenticity of the flood, right. the fact that you have so many cultures that share the same story and almost, you know, it's a righteous man and he's escaping the flood. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think it actually argues uh, in the reverse. Yeah, and that, that's the point. That, that's a good point because people yeah. would say, well, the, then, you know, Christians bought their story from other cultures. No, why can't it just be that that is what happened and other cultures have their versions of it, but we have the truth because God actually told, you know, the people who wrote the Bible, well, this is how it actually happened, where their versions are a little corrupted, but the same uh, main facts are there. Absolutely, absolutely. What's interesting is that, um, you know, this story, you know, people kind of laugh at it and go, well, it's just a little kid's story, but it's a story that's been supported by, there's, there's geological evidence for those who have an open mind to think about it and to, look, to really honestly look at the evidence and think about it. Uh, the, I think the reason why it's so repulsive to some people is because it supports what the Bible says. Yeah. Maybe if it wasn't in the Bible, some people would go, oh, maybe there really was a flood. But just because <laughs> it's in the Bible, people don't like it. Uh, but but it's, not, it's not like something, uh, you know, it's just, it has the idea that God destroyed the world with water, and that seems to be repugnant to some people. But there's a modern message to it, I think, Carol. I think the modern message to the flood story, we find in the New Testament, the passage I read earlier about uh, Peter, that, that, that God destroyed the ancient world with water, and he's going to destroy this future world with fire. Right. So uh, if that's the case, and Noah was the only one saved except for his family, then the message is today, uh, if you want to escape the coming wrath of fire in the future, you have to escape through the blood of Christ and through the ark of Christ. Jesus is like an ark, you know, yes. um, and you have to enter into him to escape uh, the coming judgment of God. But, you know, that's not, a, that's not going to win you a lot of people, a lot of friends to say that. Of course, I know, I'm sure Noah, when he was preaching that uh, there was the rain coming and that the only way to be saved from the rain was to get in, or from the flood, was to get into the ark. I'm sure people thought he was narrow-minded and, and uh, you know, just uh, a crazy old man. But, again, he's the only one who survived. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, a good thing about the point that you were talking about before as far as it being a local flood or a worldwide flood. Well, if it was just a local flood, then God could have said, well, Noah, why don't you just move over to this part 
of the earth where I'm not going to flood. Exactly. <laughs> you know? I know. Yeah. And that sort of defeated the purpose of the flood, which was to wipe out mankind because of sin. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Harold. That's exactly right. I mean, he could have just told Noah, go north yeah. or go south. You know, you he's know? given him 125 years, heads exactly. up. Exactly. You know, in 125 years, I'm destroying everything. Well, you know, in five years, you can walk to this other country. And exactly. You'll be all right. Exactly. But the, but the fossils are, are all there to see, um, you know, if, if people look at it. But the, the thing that people. Uh, you know, they, they look at the fossils and they see this, these uh, long periods of time and they think that uh, the fossils prove evolution. The fossils don't prove evolution because they don't show, they don't show the animals turning into different animals because that's what Darwin, if, you, if Darwin was right. correct, right. and the fossilized layers, what you'd expect to find is simple to complex. Well, you don't find that. You find at the very, very beginning fossils layer uh, called the Cambrian explosion, you find very complex animals at the very beginning. You don't find animals evolving from, from nothing into, you know, you find very simple, uh, you find very complex animals right there in the Cambrian explosion. Now, let me say very quickly, I know that we kind of need to wrap this on time, but um, basically uh, the way uh, flood, uh, flood scholars explain the actual ge geology is basically the reason why you find in the, in the lower strata of fossils, you find the Cambrian fossils, is that they, are, they were the fossils that were buried deep in the ocean. The waters, the Bible says that the subterranean waters under the land broke forth and so the rain came from below and the rain came from above. So that means that the uh, marine fossils would have been buried first and then the big land fossils would have been buried or the big land animals would have been buried last. That's why in the geological record you find, you find uh, you know, sea life fossils and then on the upper layers you find uh, things like dinosaurs. Well, dinosaurs could run and get out of the way, but the marine fossils couldn't. That's why they were buried first. Right. Does that make sense? That makes sense and uh, that's a good note on which to end. And I want to thank you, Ted Wright, for being on my show. Thank you. Talking about the evidence for Noah's flood. And that will end this episode of Giving an Answer. Be sure to join me again next time. And until then, goodbye and God bless. In Jude, we find him writing in verse 3, I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.